Welcome to the ADNA Presents. This is Roy Samuelson, and today we have a very special guest, Rebecca Odom. Rebecca is a quality control specialist and a middle grade and young adult author. Thanks so much for joining us, Rebecca. Thank you so much for having me, Roy. This is awesome. <laughs> this is so great. This is one of my favorite podcasts, and this podcast is actually the reason that I decided that I could do something in the field of audio description, because I heard your interview with Nefertiti. She's a narrator, and she does QC and writes, and it just inspired me so much. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I have a huge passion for audio description, so I can do that. I can do this, you know. And uh, so I decided that quality control was the best fit for me. What was it about quality control in audio description that was like a magnet for you? What got you excited about that role of audio description? A couple things. One, I didn't have any voiceover experience because I would have had to read scripts like with my screen reader and then remember the line. I didn't think that I could remember it well enough. And I've always been really nervous performing. I just get really, really nervous. And then I realized, you know, I have a background in writing. I've been an author for several years. I published one book and I'm trying to get another one published. And I realized like, you know, I listen to a lot of audio description and can tell what's good audio description and what isn't. And even more so now that I've had training, what drew me was I can listen to AD and help make it better. I can help make it better. I can, you know, pick out awkward phrasing and like if there's line stepping or I'm hearing an issue with the mix. I can watch a show or a movie and say, hey, a character's name was said wrong, or this description is confusing. And I'm not catching all of these mistakes when it's already out in the world and it's too late to fix it. And so that's what drew me, that I could help make the audio description the best that it can be. And I can be that final step before the audio description goes out into the world. Oh, that's great. It's funny you mentioned about what works and what doesn't work for AD. I'd like to ask you two questions if I could. Let's start with what works and what doesn't work with AD as far as your experience as a audience member, and then we'll get into to your training. I'd, I'd love to follow up on both aspects, and maybe there's there might be some differences. In other words, when you first heard audio description, you could start to recognize, oh, this is working or, oh, this isn't working at all. Yeah. Did you talk about that experience when you were an audience member before you started quality control? When I was an audience member before I started quality control, I didn't have the ins and outs that I have now, but I could still tell that there were mistakes. I could pick out mistakes. And I'll be honest, before I started training, I would be watching something and especially comedies. I find that because there's so much dialogue, there's less AD. But before I got training, I would watch a comedy, like a sitcom. And I would go, okay, there's space to add AD. And I would count so many spaces where AD could be added. And then I started getting into the industry and, you know, found out that, oh, you can't really add AD in every single space where there's no dialogue. And so that was always frustrating as an audience member. And then there's the recent TTS. I can't stand TTS. And I know I'm not the only one. And when you say TTS, that's text to speech. Text to speech, yeah. That's where a non-human is narrating the AD. They've come a long way, so it doesn't sound like my screen reader would sound, like very robotic, but you can tell. You can tell that it's not a human because there's no inflection. There's no emotion. And I refuse to watch anything with TTS. If it was a perfect world, we would know when something is TTS. There would be a label like TTS or not TTS. I wish that that was a thing because it would make it To where, okay, I'm going on this streaming service. Okay, this is TTS. Okay, not going to watch it because I I don't like it, especially for movies and TV shows. Like for a three-minute YouTube video that is nothing but music and text. Yeah, I can handle that. But I don't want to sit through a 
two hour movie listening to a narrator that has no emotion and no inflection. That takes me out of the story. That's some things that I noticed as an audience member. And it sounds like with that, there's a lot of differences besides just a short video versus a long video. There's also the type of content that yep. it sounds like a, even if a short film was maybe three or four minutes long, you'd still prefer a story being told. When you say uh, you don't want to be taken out of it, that seems to go along with the inflection and emotion you were mentioning. Yeah. Like I, I was watching a show the other day and the narrator, he was so good. Depending on the scene, he would match the scene match his tone with what was going on in the scene and it was just it was really cool and I'd never heard anyone do that before and I could tell I was like oh my gosh this is awesome but with TTS you don't have that you just have just straight narration with no emotion as I said if we could go back to what your experience was with quality control I think there's a tie in here that immersive experience that you want from the narration is also a part of the audio description writing script. Yes. So we've got a little lay of the land as far as your experience, Rebecca, of, of appreciating what works in audio description and what doesn't work. Now you've got training and you've got this motivation to be a quality control person. How did the training help with your quality control? It gave me the do's and don'ts of AD. And it gave me hands-on experience. The training that I took, and I want to give a shout out to Colleen from AD Training Retreats. She is awesome. Yes. Um, I took her class. It was amazing. It gave me the rules. Instead of just listening to AD as an audience member, I knew the whole process what went into making it when I was mentioning watching a sitcom. Now I know why spaces are left. And I know that it's the writer's choice to describe that or not to describe it if there's enough space. I've done some co-writing of AD, so I know how hard it is to fit a line of AD in a really tight space. And sometimes it's just not possible. It's so neat to hear about the experience you had with Colleen's AD training retreats and how that took what you already knew as an audience member and gave it a, a different perspective. Do you feel like your quality control work has helped your own appreciation of good AD? In other words, we found out, OK, you've got the experience as an audience and now you've got the quality control training. Has it worked the other way? In other words, have you been able to enjoy audio description even more because of the training? I have actually, but sometimes I can't turn off my QC brain, as it were. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll be listening to something and I'll be like, okay, they said a name wrong here and it was supposed to be this name, not that name, or, oh, the AD is overpowering the rest of the show or vice versa, or this is awkward phrasing or confusing phrasing. Like I'll just be analyzing it, you know, while I'm watching and I've had to kind of go, okay, I'm watching this for entertainment and the AD is already out in the world. So the mistakes I'm finding, there's nothing I can do about it. So I just kind of have to just enjoy what I'm watching and not put my editor's cap on, as it were. I hear you. And it's interesting because this podcast is created for what you just described at the beginning. In other words, it was created and intended so that we could interview people like yourself that work in audio description to let other people that are interested in it to know some of the th things that are happening. And I can't help but think that as more people even listen to your podcast interview here, will be able to appreciate and say, hey, I want to be a part of this and, yeah. and learn more. How do you feel about modeling this for other people? Do you feel like you want to help support other people do what you're doing so that when you are listening to audio description as an audience, that you can get a better experience? Yes, I would love it if everybody that wants to do QC, every single one of us, we all had the opportunity to do so. And this is going back to in a in a perfect world, we would have that opportunity. There's so much content that needs AD, old stuff and new stuff. It would be amazing if QC could be added 
to the overall process, like writing and narrating is. That it's not just, oh, a show here, a show there. Like that there was time to add QC as a part of the process. Well, let's talk a little more because right now we're specifically talking about film and TV audio description. Yes. And with that, there's over 9,000 titles that have audio description. I'm wondering about how you feel when it comes to the outreach. I'm hesitating a little bit, Rebecca, because how you approach your business is your business. Yeah. But is there anything that you could share publicly about how you approached getting your work in AD that might be helpful? First off, training. That's the big one. Unfortunately, there's not a training in QC because there's not a standard process. Each company is going to have their own way that they want to do QC. And that was something that I had to learn when I started this. I had to learn, okay, each company is going to have their own process. There is no standard practice. I can't go and memorize the steps to do this. I have to go by what each company wants. And I'm thinking about the example of if you wanted to be a chef, you'd still study to be a chef, but you'd have a different experience at McDonald's versus Outback. Forgive me. Exactly. It's like every company has their own way of approaching it. Yeah. You still needed that training to get at least the baseline, right? I still needed the training. Yeah. And also practice. I was very lucky to meet a group of women who were trying to get into the industry. They're in the industry now. But at the time, they were meeting to practice describing and writing and narrating and all of that. So I came on as their QC person and that really helped me. And I got to sit in on the whole process. I was getting to basically co-write. That helped me too, because it got me practice not only doing QC, but actually getting to participate in in a little bit of the writing. And that actually helped my being able to do QC the way that I do it, because I have that foundation, not just the training, but the practice in doing it. And getting to co-write was a big thing. Experiencing the whole process helps in QC. Because you know the work that it took to write the script, to narrate it, to do the mix. I know all of it. And so I'm able to go, okay, I know that this script for this 30-minute show took six hours to write. So that really, really helped me. Even though I'm not writing, I'm not narrating, I really like that I was exposed to those two things from the ground up because it helped me with my QC. It sounds like you've got a really winning formula here from starting with passion, going to training, and then practice, and then experience with working with people. In any approach, whether it's audio description or any business or professional development, this seems like a really clear way of approaching it, even though everything's different in each each segment. Yeah. And I'll be honest, when I first got into this, I was trying to find information on what was involved in QC, what I had to do to get into it. I didn't know. I had to just ask questions and just connect with people. So that's where social media came in. And I just asked questions and just emailed people and just learned all I could. And then I took training and did practice. And here we are. It's so great to hear about your connection with others. I think about my own career in the same way that your career has been supported by people that have helped and offered to help. And it's an initiative. And I really relate to you talking about that. It does make a difference for me. It's it's great to hear you say it like that. If I can help someone else start their journey and provide that support, I would totally do that. And I have. I've helped a few people with the knowledge that I have obtained. And I mean, everyone is going to approach this differently. But the one thing that I have told people is get training, not necessarily QC training, because there isn't any, but AD training, because that is definitely valuable. I can hear the impact it's had on you. Oh, yeah. We've covered so much from listening to these interviews on this very podcast that you're on. Yes. 
to the uh, experience in audio description, to your training with Colleen at AD Training Retreats, your practice with the women and the experience that you had with that and the support that you got. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with people about your journey? In a perfect world, that there would be enough work for everyone. That is what I hope for in the future is that not only writing, narrating, mixing, but also QC will become a part of the process and that the time will be allowed for that because it does take time to QC an hour long show. It's not me just sitting back and watching it for entertainment and it's done in an hour. It's me literally analyzing the AD. So it takes a little bit, you know, but my goal is to help as much as I can in this field and to help make audio description the best that it can be. I'm looking forward to more opportunities to do that. Well, that sounds great, Rebecca. And it's great to hear that you've already made an impact just with the work that you've done. People can go to the adna.org and see your credits. We'll put the link to this podcast on that page too, so people can hear from you directly. How can people follow you, a website, social media? I'm on Twitter, and the username for that is rwrites, W-R-I-T-E-S, fantasy, because that's my genre that I write. So that's my handle on Twitter, and then I'm on LinkedIn. So anyone that has LinkedIn can follow me on there. Thanks so much for joining us, Rebecca. Rebecca. 